So I think uh, the, this last session will be quite interesting because it's a nice mixture of topics. Uh, there's something for the hardware people and after that we will also zoom out quite a lot <laughs> to look a little bit of uh, on community perspectives. Hello, hello. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's a little bit low volume. I don't know. I can also try to speak a bit louder. Okay, cool. So the next speaker is uh, Jasper uh, Defrecker. I think that the name, if you pronounce it right, it sounds like you're destroying developers, but I think that's <laughs> not what you're aiming to do. Uh, yeah, he's joining us from uh, Decimo in Gent, uh, where they develop uh, and do consulting of uh, software a lot of embedded things and electronics, PCB stuff, yep. something like that. Okay, cool. Um, there's a good connection between this talk and the keynote because we will also see some more stuff about reverse engineering. What he will show is his work on reverse engineering the ESP32 Wi-Fi uh, hardware to make it possible to have an open source uh, Wi-Fi Mac layer. I think that's quite interesting and I'm very curious what we will report, so the stage is yours. Okay, so I'm going to talk about reverse engineering the uh, ESP32 Wi-Fi. A quick show of hands, who has worked with the ESP32 before? Okay, that's about 70% of the audience, so this should be your talk. Um, so I'll introduce it anyways. Um, the ESP32 is a very cheap uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth microcontroller. Um, it has two cores and about half a megabyte of RAM. Um, it runs, uh, if you use the default SDK, uh, free RTOS. Um, and it is, because of its cost and capabilities, uh, of course, very popular with makers and engineers. Uh, so a bit of history. Uh, the ESP32 is made by Espressive. Um, they first got known for their ESP8266 module, uh, which started out as this very badly documented uh, Wi-Fi modem, which you could send AT commands to, and then it would reply. Um, but then soon, uh, hackers figured out that, hey, we can actually run our own code on this. Uh, and it got picked up in the maker community. Uh, and then now we're 10 years later, uh, and a lot of chips have been pr produced. Uh, and also, it's very nice to develop for, uh, because almost the entire SDK is open source. Almost, I say. Uh, well, not entirely. The uh, library to control the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth uh, is not open source. They are provided as these uh, binary blobs that you can compile into your project. Uh, and these abstract away the whole Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth stack. For example, instead of saying, uh, okay, send this packet to the access point and then I get this packet back and then I will reply with this packet, you just say to the library, okay, connect to this access point. And funny story, the binary blobs are open source, as in they put the binary blobs under an open source license, uh, but they didn't actually release the source, which, which is a bit strange, uh, but it's still useful to us um, since they released it under an open source license. We're explicitly allowed to reverse engineer the blobs, uh, so that's useful that they can't sue us, I guess. Uh, so why do I want to reverse engineer the Wi-Fi? Uh, originally, I wanted to do it to get proper mesh networking. Um, as in the standard compliant 802.11s, uh, um, instead of their proprietary uh, mesh implementation that only lets you send messages back and forth instead of having a whole IP layer. Uh, it also helps with auditability. It makes it easier to find security vulnerabilities. Uh, and also, I really like the spirit of making hardware things uh, do things it was not supposed to do, uh, the original hacker spirit, I guess. So uh, now I'll talk a bit about how I did what I did. Uh, so first I did, uh, there are basically three types of analysis I did to reverse engineer this. Um, static analysis and dynamic analysis. The difference is with static analysis you just uh, extract the, the blob, the, the binary blob, the, the library, and you look at the uh, assembly instructions and you decompile it and then you look at the code. Uh, with dynamic analysis you actually execute the code and then you see how it behaves and based on that you can also reverse engineer that. These approaches all have their advantages and drawbacks so I'll use uh, all three of them. 
Um, so I'll talk a bit about the static analysis. Uh, for this, I used Gidra. This is an open source tool released by the NSA. Um, and they now have mainline support for Extensa, which, the, which is the CPU architecture that the uh, ESP32 uses. And luckily enough for us, uh, Espressive did not strip the function names. And this really helps a lot, um, because now you can see, or you can guess, I guess, from the function name what the function is supposed to do. Uh, they mostly gave them good names. Some are a bit mysterious. Um, but it, it already helps a lot to figure out what a function is supposed to do. So at, as you can see on, the, on this slide, uh, this is basically what, what code you would get out of it. Um, so it, it writes to raw memory, uh, because that's, that's how uh, the Wi-Fi interaction works. Uh, I also did dynamic analysis on real hardware. So what that means is you have an actual ESP32. Uh, you attach a JTAG debugger to it, uh, and then you can step through the code, place breakpoints, uh, and so on. Um, the problem with actually doing that is if you just do it out, out in the open, um, there are a lot of other Wi-Fi networks nearby. So if you want to capture that one packet you may be sent or maybe not sent, uh, it's hard to do. Uh, so I have a solution for this. Uh, I built an affordable Faraday cage. Uh, the usual advice is place your device in a microwave, uh, and then that will shield your, your device. Uh, no, it will not actually work. Uh, you can easily test it by placing your phone in a microwave. And don't turn it on. Um, it does not actually stop you from getting calls or getting uh, Wi-Fi reception. Uh, it doesn't attenuate the signal off. This uh, homemade Faraday cage, uh, built for about 300 euros, uh, does block the signal. Uh, it was built from um, this uh, conductive fabric. Um, and then I put a copper tube through it and fiber optics cable. Uh, so that way it blocks the signal, uh, it, it blocks the RF, but it still lets data through. Uh, but then you have the problem of how do I get power inside of the Faraday cage. Uh, and for that I used a big lead acid uh, car battery. Uh, so you, sure, you have limited time to do your research, but it still gives you the possibility to power it. Because these uh, power line filters, they use it in uh, MRI machines. To, to block RF, uh, but still at power to these are very expensive. Uh, so that was an affordable way to isolate the ESP32 under research from the other Wi-Fi networks in the, in the area. Uh, and then I also did dynamic analysis in an emulator. So this is also running the code, but in an emulator. Um, Espressive fortunately already had, had a fork of uh, QEMU, a, pro, uh, a popular emulator. Um, but they did not have support for the Wi-Fi peripheral. Uh, so based on the static analysis, I added guesses of what I think the, the Wi-Fi peripheral would act like, and then execute it in the emulator. And if it crashes, I guess my guess was not right. Uh, so I then modified it a bit until it kept running. And that way, I could see how the execution really happened. Uh, and I also added a feature to QEMU called the execution tracing, where Every access it did to the peripheral, to the, to the Wi-Fi peripheral, um, it would uh, stop the CPU, take a whole stack dump, and then restart the CPU again. So that way, you can see which functions touch which uh, registers. Uh, so now I'll talk a bit about the results I obtained through this. Um, so there is this proprietary code that uh, initializes the whole hardware. Uh, it com it uh, calibrates the radio and so on. Um, so we still have to use that for initialization. But after that, uh, we can execute our own code and to send and receive packets, um, which lets us entirely eliminate the uh, proprietary free Airtos task. Uh, yeah, I'll talk a bit about that later also. Uh, so here's how the TX works. Uh, so it works via DMA. So what it first does is it sets up this, uh, this middle DMA structure, which is just like a C struct. And in that, it has a pointer to the packet it wants to send. And it also embeds uh, some data about the packet, like the, the length. And what you do is you write the address of the DMA structure to uh, a memory, uh, to a, a register in, in memory. Uh, and then the hardware will handle the entire sending of the packet for you. Uh, and you will get an interrupt back when it finishes. Uh, so that means either you got an ACK back from the 
from the, the other client you sent the, the packet through, or it timed out or something else happened. Uh, and then here's how the Rx works internally. Uh, so you have also these DMA structures, uh, and these contain pointers to buffers where packets can be received in, and these are put in a linked list. Uh, and then you write the first entry of the linked list to a memory peripheral, uh, and then the Wi-Fi peripheral knows, okay, if I receive a packet, I'll put it in this DMA structure with points to, to this uh, packet. Uh, and then it also fires an interrupt, so you can handle this uh, asynchronously. And then, of course, you don't want to uh, allocate new buffers for new packets every time, because then you have a lot of load on your allocator. Uh, so what you do is, after you finished handling a received packet, you can reuse the packet buffer, uh, put it in another DMA struct, or even in the same DMA struct, put it back in the linked list, uh, and that way you don't have to constantly allocate and, and uh, deallocate memory. Uh, so then I use these uh, TX and RX primitives uh, to connect to an access point, which is surprisingly easy if it's an open access point, that means without uh, authentication. So you still have to send an authentication request, uh, and then you always get back, it's okay because it's an open access point, uh, and then you associate with the access point, you get an association response back, and then you're authenticated to the access point, and from then on you can start sending uh, Wi-Fi packets. Uh, so what we do to, uh, to do this on the ESP32, ESP uh, we pretend that we're an Ethernet card in, in software because they have support for creating custom Ethernet card drivers. Uh, but we're not actually an Ethernet card, and then we transform the data a bit uh, so that it becomes a Wi-Fi data frame, and then we send those data frames. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we can now ping the, uh, the, the, the ESP32 with only open source code running, which is a bit of a misleading statement. Um, and also, as you can see, there is still a bug where we sometimes get duplicate ping packets, uh, but we have found how to solve this by now. Uh, so future work, uh, we can ping the packets without open so uh, with only open source code running. That is true, technically, um, because we still need the entire proprietary code to initialize the hardware, but once the initialization is done, um, we can stop all proprietary code, uh, and then we can only use our code to send and receive packets. Uh, unfortunately, this, this uh, initialization code is very complex because it needs to do calibration of the TX and RX part of the Wi-Fi radio. Um, yeah, and this is black RF magic, and you also don't know what the registers do, so it's kind of hard to, to reverse engineer. Uh, so for now, we, yeah, basically we'll, we'll keep this uh, binary blob uh, to do the radio calibration in the beginning, uh, and maybe in the future there's this project called uh, ref.ng, which offers to do binary translation of your binaries back to compilable C, which sounds very promising. I don't know how it will actually, how good it will actually work, but maybe we can use that in the future to replace the in initialization functions. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, further RF uh, hardware uh, reverse engineering still to be done. Uh, for example, we can now do uh, 802.11 uh, A and B and G, but not the newer uh, 802.11 N, which has a faster data throughput uh, and also a new uh, file header. Uh, we can't do that yet because we haven't reverse engineered it, but it seems to look pretty doable. Uh, there are also some other less used, I guess, uh, Wi-Fi features like uh, MPDU and then using 40 megahertz of uh, bandwidth and QoS, which allows you to prioritize certain packets. We also haven't uh, implemented that yet. Uh, and then there's also WPA, which is like this cryptography you can use to protect your access points. Uh, and the ESP32 has hardware acceleration for it. Uh, we also still haven't reverse engineered uh, how that works. Uh, yeah, and then changing channels. We know about how to do this, uh, but not entirely. Uh, and changing the TX power, uh, also future work. Uh, so now we can send and receive packets, uh, which is nice, uh, but we still have to know what packets to actually send. Um, so for this, we need uh, a Mac stack, and there are several open source uh, versions. Uh, 
FreeBSD has a Mac stack, uh, Linux has a Mac stack, um, but these are all intended to be run on uh, more like microcomputers than microcontrollers. Um, so I, I was thinking, uh, okay, we'll do the same thing as Espressif did, just port the FreeBSD stack uh, to the ESP32. Uh, and I know they did this because they put it in their uh, licenses they used. Uh, they unfortunately also don't have to open source it because uh, it's under the BSD license. Uh, and then I actually tried to do that, the porting, and it turned out to be uh, not so nice. Uh, so now we'll write the, uh, a new Wi-Fi stack uh, in Rust. Um, yeah, we're working on that. Uh, and then also this work is now focused on the ESP32. Um, but there are a lot of other ESP32 variants, uh, for example, the RISC-V versions the, the, with the letter C in them. Um, from some preliminary reverse engineering of another contributor, they seem to be very similar. So the hope is that we can dive deep into the ESP32 and then be able to port the work to, to uh, other uh, microcontrollers. Uh, and then Bluetooth. Uh, and then I would like to thank uh, the contributors on this project. Uh, I'd also like to, t to thank uh, my day job. Uh, they flew me out here and they, they paid for the hotel, which is very nice of them. And it's also a nice place to work. Uh, and I'd like to thank the members of my hackerspace who uh, supported me in this. Okay, any questions? Thanks a lot for that. That was pretty interesting. I have one question in case. Always Hannes. <laughs> <laughs> on, on one slide, you provided the motivation for why you were doing this. And I was specifically wondering about one aspect because in this case, you have a company. Uh, intentionally providing some proprietary stuff for whatever exactly their reason is and they don't want to open source it um, and in s so you spend obviously all that time and effort to reverse engineer it and to make it for the to make the whole product more um, interesting mm -hmm. uh, and rewarding for the developers but in some sense that rewards the company to continue with their pattern uh, in s I would have uh, like like to see a scheme that where companies that actually open source their stuff and that they are rewarded that we actually use their stuff uh, and instead of sort of like being um, pushing sort of like trying to spend our time analyzing essentially providing doing the work that they should be doing uh, in the first place I wonder whether you had at some point in time that thought and thought like hey you guys should really do your homework and just be nicer to the community rather than giving us a hard time. Yeah, um, so there is a very long-standing issue since uh, 2016 opened in their GitHub um, where they asked for an, an open Mac stack uh, and the developers even said they, they would implement it. Um, the problem is that they have um, the actual Wi-Fi part in their microcontroller. They license it from another company, uh, so they can't release all of that uh, apparently. Um, and in their implementation, they say it's hard to detangle the Mac stack from the stuff that they need to keep proprietary. Um, and I think there might also be some issues where the FCC doesn't like um, radio code being open, but I don't entirely know about it. Okay, any further questions? Okay, then thanks again. Okay. Um, my last question would be, uh, how far away are you from PRing this? From, <laughs> from what? PR, uh, getting it into a PR ready state to. Ooh, um, <laughs> I don't know if they will ever accept the PR um, because yeah, their stack right now has a lot more features and also it's hard to they know exactly what their hardware does because they made the hardware, uh, and I have to guess. So, yeah. I was actually more thinking of PR into Riot, but uh -huh. it's <laughs> it's fine. I mean, maybe the manufacturer you can teach them this way if if you. No. 
Is there actually uh, uh, some hardware for IoT devices that provides an open source stack of uh, some company? Uh, yes, I can actually answer this. Um, no. Um, oh. Except okay. uh, there's this project called uh, Open Wi-Fi, which, has, which implements the entire 802.11 stack on an FPGA. But I actually held it in my hands, and it's uh, one, very expensive, uh, and two, very power hungry. So it's not really ready to use yet, but I guess that could be an answer if you really wanted uh, a fully open source uh, what is, stack. Um, I used a, I think it was two years ago, I, I, I reviewed code for a networking stack on, on, on Linux. Uh, so mm -hmm. the stack was itself, uh, so the company replaced the, uh, the existing Wi-Fi stack. They made modifications to the Mac and so uh, made that sort of like optimized for industrial use. Um, so, and that was at least something that was available. Of course, the, the details on the hardware, they were not uh, open source, but the rest of the, the hardware, uh, the Mac layer was open source, which could be modified and then simplified. Um, so at least on Linux, that was available. So I'm, I'm curious why, there are, why there's nothing similar for sort of like the, the IoT space. That's somewhat surprising. I want. I wonder whether that would be an interesting project for the community to actually maybe take that uh, stack that you mentioned, the open Wi-Fi stack, which I never looked at, and, and then um, obviously running it on an FPGA is not a useful thing in this context, but uh, then having a, actually a chip taped out. That would be yeah, this could be done, but it's obviously very uh, expensive uh, getting a, a chip taped out. Yeah, it's not a hobby project, I guess. Thanks. Okay, cool. So then, let's thank him again. Nice job.